Welcome to History Author Talks. I am very pleased this evening that we have something a little bit different. Um, and I think that this is going to be a great show. Um, I want to uh, remind everybody that uh, we look forward to having your questions um, as the authors will do their uh, presentations. Your questions will come using the chat using the chat feature, you will send questions that will come directly to me. I'm Roger Williams. I'm the producer of this show. And I will then forward your questions to our guest host, who I will introduce in a moment. And I will then, um, we will have our author presentations. And then after the author presentations, uh, we will have our question and answer period. We will also um, be, I will also be sending you links to our author's websites uh, during, uh, during the show. Um, and without, without further ado, um, I would like very much uh, to now introduce you to our guest host. Our guest host is Eric Denzenhall. Uh, author of the for forthcoming novel, novel False Light. Uh, he has written quite a few other novels and also nonfiction books. And with that, I am very pleased to turn this over uh, to, uh, to Eric. So over to you, Eric. Uh, thanks, thanks, Roger. I, I am your uh, Vanna White for the evening. And um, Rather than one of my pet peeves and things like this is when people give very long introductions to authors or other people that they could find online. So uh, both Tom and David are friends of mine and they won't take it as short shrift to them. But I'd like to first introduce uh, David to talk. Uh, David is an attorney, author and historian. He writes fiction and nonfiction. His next book uh, out, I believe in February is a political biography of George Washington. And he's going to be talking now about the Paris deception. David. Thanks so much, Eric. And I want to express my gratitude for being here and for all you folks who have shown up. And uh, we have arranged that we are going to begin by toasting you, our audience, uh, with uh, a sidecar drink, which is featured in my novel. Um, it was a relatively new drink in 1919. Um, and it has become sort of a favorite of mine. So cheers. Um, and I hope you have some suitable libation of your own. <laughs> I will be, I will not be dipping into that through the presentation. That would be unwise. Um, I, uh, I want to, uh, about the Paris deception, um, it's, a, it's a treat to have a chance to talk about it. It was, the, it's the second book of a series. Um, there are three of them, uh, my deception novels. Um, so I already had the two protagonists um, who had appeared in the first book, uh, The Lincoln Deception, which focuses on the John Wilkes Booth conspiracy. Um, and they are uh, a, a white uh, uh, doctor from Ohio, uh, Jamie Fraser, and his, uh, he, he connects with a black former baseball player who is modeled on a real guy, uh, Moses Fleetwood Walker, who was the last black man to play in professional baseball in the 1880s and was driven out of the sport. Um, he became a very outspoken, what it was called at the time, race man. You can hear we have images of them here. I, they're probably not coming through very well. My grandchildren complain when I do that too. Um, and uh, he is, uh, it, it creates something of a a tense partnership. They uh, don't always get, get along too well and they don't always talk to each other in the same language. Um, I took a chance with the Paris deception because the Lincoln deception was set in 1900 and I vaulted them ahead uh, 19 years um, to the Paris Peace Conference, which tragically meant they got a lot older so they were capable, capable of a bit less daring do. Um, but I very much wanted to deal, uh, have a chance to talk about and study the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, ending World War I. Um, it was such a pivotal moment in our history. And Roger, if you can put up that first slide, um, you might get a flavor for that 
um, from this map of Europe in 1914. Uh, should we get it up? Um, it's coming. And there you can see uh, there are four empires that cover most of this map. The Russian Empire, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. They're all going to be vaporized. They're all going away. And something is going to replace them. And that's what the Paris Peace Conference was mostly about. They also carved up lands in Asia and Africa. Okay, that's enough on, on the map. Um, and great swaths of the globe were going to be re redistributed. Um, and they were doing this on the ashes of uh, a world war in which uh, 16 million people had been slaughtered. Um, that, of course, was a massive um, impact globally, but it also involved a war that was fought in a new way. The technology of war had really transformed a way we may not appreciate today, but machine guns were in regular use. Uh, submarines, airplanes, bomb, you know, death from the skies. Uh, this created a, a very uh, almost end of the world vibration for a lot of people. Um, and then at the, towards the end of the war, you got communist revolutions, obviously in, the Rus in Russia, but also in Hungary. You had one in, of all places, Egypt. Um, so much of the social order is being transformed. And then layered on top of that is the pandemic of the Spanish flu. Uh, we are struggling with our pandemic and not really doing as well as we might. Um, but then, you know, 50 million people died worldwide. Um, I think the number in this country was something like 6 million. I mean, it was a massive thing. Uh, actually, the German generals blamed the pandemic for losing the war. You got to blame somebody, but um, they, they actually had some basis for it. So this was a bleak time. And the peace conference combined a sort of amazing arrogance and a fascinating burst of idealism in this bleak time. Uh, the, the terrible arrogance of the time, moment was that basically three old white guys Woodrow Wilson from the United States, David Lloyd George from Britain, and uh, George Clemenceau from France basically took the maps of the world and carved them up. They drew lines that they didn't quite understand what they would mean. But it was all very much driven by this burst of idealism, which came from Woodrow Wilson. Uh, he issued, when, when the United States entered the war, he issued his 14 points, which you may remember from history, um, and it promised all sorts of things to change the way the public's business would be done, that there would be no more secret diplomacy, uh, that colonialism would be repudiated, free trade would blossom, uh, there would be self-determination around the world, and this sort of was letting the genie out of the bottle. We got a lot of uh, nationalism out of it. And he also proposed the League of Nations, that this would be a peacekeeping organization for the whole world. Um, and Roger, if you can show the, uh, the next slide, you have, when Wilson first comes to Europe, he is acclaimed really as a savior. Um, millions of people greet him in the streets of Paris, again in the streets of Rome, and again in London. And we, there are a couple of images of that. I mean, imagine uh, our current president arriving in Paris and having a sign like that hung over a major uh, thoroughfare. Um, Wilson was an extraordinary figure, and I just want to read to you. Uh, th that's an, that's enough of that, Roger. Um, uh, from what Herbert Hoover wrote in a memoir, uh, he had been in France at the time. He was no fuzzy-headed idealist. Um, this is Herbert Hoover of the Depression. Um, and he wrote that the 14 points of Wilson stirred hope among the masses everywhere in the world. To them, no man of such moral and political power and no such an evangel of peace had appeared since Christ preached the Sermon on the Mount. Everywhere men believed that a new era had come to all mankind. It was the star of Bethlehem rising again. 
Woodrow Wilson had reached the zenith of intellectual and spiritual leadership of the whole world. Never, never hitherto known in history. I mean, this is almost an orgasmic uh, description from a pretty non-orgasmic guy. And it does capture some of the feel that was in the air that the world would be transformed. And that was some of the hopes of the peace conference. Um, also at the conference, you had this amazing collection of characters. Clemenceau of France, one of my favorites, he fought, I don't know, 11 duels in his life. Um, in the middle of the conference, he was shot by an assassin and he, he survived and he said he was humiliated by the fact that a Frenchman had stood eight feet away from him and shot seven times and only hit him once. Um, and it, he, he was a very colorful, larger than life figure. Winston Churchill was there. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia was there wearing his Arab muff tee. I mean, it, it was uh, the sort of uh, setting you, you couldn't make up as, as a novelist. Um, and, and that is maybe something I, I want to stress, which is I do try to follow a basic rule of historical fiction um, to respect the known facts. I'm not a counterfactual or a sort of alternative history person. I believe in respecting what we know and not changing that. So it, you can sort of summarize that in the phrase uh, that I use, which is uh, you can make up a lot, but Abraham Lincoln has to be tall. Um, and the trick is integrating those real characters and events with my characters. Uh, it was pretty easy with Dr. Fraser. Um, we put him in the Army Medical Corps and sent him to Europe to take care of the troops. And of course, he had to treat the pandemic. And the pandemic decimated our army and everybody else's. And then during the peace conference, Woodrow Wilson got very sick twice. And they had to call in do special doctors to deal with him. Um, people in whether he had the flu or whether he had strokes. Um, and I offer my own views in the novel. Um, but it's a great opportunity to have my character in intimate connection with the president. And to be honest, he's in the president's bathroom and the president in his bedroom and the president's in his pajamas in bed. So it, it's, a, it's a fun setting for uh, a novelist. Um, for Speed Cook, the angle was race. Um, his son is a sergeant in the U.S. Army. He had been a, you know, a young boy in the Lincoln deception, so he was still uh, he was available, and he's being railroaded on the false charge of desertion. And it was an opportunity to write about the racism that really uh, beset our armed forces at the time. Uh, it was a national shame, to be honest. Um, our Black soldiers were in segregated units. They were not allowed to have black officers, only white officers. And our generals wouldn't let them go into battle. They, they didn't trust them. So the French army said, well, if you're not using them, we'll use them. And so many of our black soldiers ended up fighting for the French in the war. And they much preferred it. Um, they turned out in many instances to be quite valiant units. Um, the French honored them greatly. Uh, but because the French treated them better, they, they preferred to fight there. And then Speed Cook can be in Paris because at the same time that the Paris Peace Conference was meeting, there was a Pan-African Congress that had been summoned by W.E.B. Du Bois, the famous leader of the NAACP, um, to happen at the same time. And uh, Cook is working for uh, Du Bois. So that was a really, um, a way to get a a picture of the, the, the this whole amazing canvas that was going on that, that was before everyone. The challenge then is to get the hinge between the real and the fictional characters to work. And I got lucky there. One of the things I tell myself when I get stuck on a historical fiction project is that history will provide and that if I read more history, I'll find a way out. And it worked here, um, largely because I came upon the Dulles family. 
Um, you will certainly remember John Foster Dulles, who was Secretary of State for Eisenhower, and Alan Dulles, who was CIA Director for Eisenhower, and then for Kennedy for a short time until the Bay of Pigs. And he, uh, in 1919, was a 25-year-old ex-spy. Uh, he had been a spy in Switzerland during the war. Uh, it was easy for him to get the job, it turned out, because his uncle was Secretary of State. Um, <laughs> was uh, Robert Lansing. It's always a good move to have your uncle be Secretary of State. And he then comes to Paris, as does his brother, John Foster. They're both part of the American team. And because Wilson, who was a difficult man, uh, he didn't get along with people so easily, uh, hated his Secretary of State. He had a very close senior advisor named Edward House, who was called Colonel House, not for any military distinction, but because that's what you call the gentleman from Texas. Um, and he was on the outs with Colonel House. So this 25 year old ex spy became his chief of staff, which is both improbable and fascinating. Uh, Alan Dulles was a competent guy, but he would not have pegged him for that. And then I was able to put him, it, it actually we do have an image of these guys, R Roger, if you can put that last PowerPoint slide up with the, Dull the Dulles boys and Lansing, it, it's sort of, uh, oh no, it's beyond after this, this is the black soldiers. Here, that's Alan, and there's Secretary of State and we have John Foster coming up in his uh, constipated fashion. So that's enough of them. But I was able to use these guys to explore uh, the final crisis of the peace conference, which also is one of the mysteries. You know, obviously the title is Deception, so I have to have some of that. And one of the greatest weirdnesses of the conference was that only the winners were there that the losing sides were not invited. So the winners sat around and carved everything up. And then at the last minute, they called in the Germans and said, here, sign. And it was a treaty that if any German politician signed that it would end his career. So they refused. <laughs> this was not anticipated. It created a tremendous tumult. The allies started moving troops into the Ruhr Valley. They worked everybody's terrified and running in circles. We're going to have a resumption of the world war. And then suddenly, overnight, the German government completely turns over. All of the cabinet members are replaced. This is a largely unexplained phenomenon in German history, this moment. And the new government comes in and signs the treaty, meek as kittens. And that's fact. And what I was had the pleasure of doing was tying Alan Dulles and my characters uh, into the effort to make that happen. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. And with your indulgence, I think I have the time. To, I, let me just read a short passage. When Dulles comes in and tells uh, Woodrow Wilson about this, and, and they talk about this final resolution Mr. President, Dulles stopped halfway into the room. Allow me to congratulate you on the new German government. We've been advised that they accept the treaty terms. It is splendid, yes. As the Duke of Wellington said, it was a near run thing. I can't imagine what they were thinking. They complained that the treaty blames Germany for causing the war in the first place. So to vindicate themselves, they threatened to provoke a second war. He shook his head and gestured for Dulles to sit. For a race that prides itself on its rationality, the Germans could be most irrational. Well, we can hope that Herr Bauer will be different. His acceptance of the treaty was his very first act as the new Reich Minister President. Wilson came around his desk and sat in the other armchair. He gazed out the window, a small smile on his face. What do we know about how Herr Bauer came to power? Your uncle Lansing has claimed not to know much about it. I'm in the dark as well, Mr. President. It's internal German politics, you know. Perhaps my brother can explain it. 
Of course, of course, Wilson pursed his lips. The Dulles brothers had proved so very useful. Wilson knew that he didn't have to like the men who were useful to him, but he couldn't shake the feeling that the Dulles family had hearts unlike his heart. It takes a kind of courage, Wilson said, to sign a surrender. Losing a war is no easy thing. I grew up in a country that had recently lost a disastrous war. It leaves scars that don't ever really heal. There's a lot of blaming. Dulles was puzzled for a moment then realized that Wilson meant his boyhood in the South after the Civil War. The president rose and walked over to stare out his window, hands again gathered behind his back. Dulles judged that he shouldn't intrude on the presidential reverie. And that I found in my book titled Deception that there's often more than one deception. That's, I'm afraid, only one of the deceptions there, but there is sort of a two-sided deception where both the president decides it's okay that he doesn't know what happened and Dulles is not about to tell him. So thank you very much. Eric, back to you. Thanks, thanks, David. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Tom. Uh, Tom is uh, an author, Tom Young, I should say, is the author of um, fiction and historical fiction. He is a decorated flight engineer who spent his career with the Air National Guard. And um, I recently retired, and I hope uh, Tom takes some of his retirement to convince me that flying is safe. I, 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 I have some questions about that. And um, now he's going to talk a bit about his novel, Silver Wings, Iron Cross, set in World War II. Thanks so much, Eric. Flying is indeed safe. I'll be happy to chat with you about that uh, further. But yeah, you, you're, you're getting into one of my favorite subjects. But uh, it's good to see you and uh, David again, both are old friends. And my thanks to Roger for uh, setting this up and making this possible. And my thanks to everybody who's joining us. This is quite an honor. My previous novels up until my latest one uh, have been military thrillers set in the present day. But with my newest book, Silver Wings, Iron Cross, I've turned to historical fiction. Uh, here's a look at the uh, book if you'd like to check out the cover. Um, and to give you a brief plot, plot summary, near the end of World War II, a downed American pilot and a deserting German officer try to survive together as the Third Reich collapses around them. And although this book is a war story, uh, very much an adventure story, I like to think it's also highly character driven. It's not just about action and hardware. So to tell you a little bit about the two main characters, uh, Carl is the American half of this duo. He's a B-17 pilot. Uh, he's the aircraft commander of a B-17 flying fortress. And he comes from a German American family in Pennsylvania. He grew up speaking German in the home and he has a lot of cultural connections to Germany. He has extended family in Germany, but he's very much a loyal American. He's all about his mission. He's not at all conflicted about that. He's all about helping defeat Nazi Germany. But on what would be his last mission before completing his tour and getting to rotate back home to the States, he gets an assignment that does cause him uh, some heartache. He finds he's assigned to uh, strike targets in Bremen. And he would really rather not bomb Bremen because that's where his extended family lives. And as he begins his day, he's hoping he'll find a legitimate reason not to fly. He's hoping he'll find uh, something wrong with the airplane in a pre-flight inspection, or maybe the uh, weather will turn and the mission will get scrubbed. None of that happens. So with a heavy heart, he takes off uh, on this mission to bomb targets uh, in Bremen. And on what would have been his last mission, he gets shot down. He manages to bail out. He survives the shoot down. And because he speaks German and knows the culture, once he gets on the ground, if he can ditch his uniform and put on civilian clothes, he can kind of blend in. And that's where his story begins. Meanwhile, my other main character, Wilhelm, is an executive officer on a German U-boat. And uh, as I mentioned, this uh, story begins late in the war. It starts in November of 1944. And uh, at this point in the war, uh, Wilhelm's story opens as his U-boat is limping back into its base at Bremen. At the end of a tough patrol, the U-boat has taken battle damage, the crew has taken casualties, 
And uh, as they're on their way back home to Bremen, they get what amounts to a suicide order. Uh, they receive a radiogram from the Admiralty that says, when you come back into port, after you rearm and refit, when you go back out, after your torpedoes are expended, attack Allied shipping by ramming. And according to the research that I did, such an order did go out to a handful of German U-boats uh, near the end of World War II. Uh, I read a wonderful memoir by one of the few surviving German U-boat captains who said uh, that order went out to something like uh, 14 U-boats. I don't know that any of them actually carried it out. And uh, Wilhelm decides he's having none of it either. He's never been a committed Nazi. In fact, he's never been a member of the Nazi party. Uh, at this point in the war, he's very disillusioned. Uh, he sees that the Nazi cause is a lost cause, and he decides he's not going to sacrifice his crew for this lost cause. And he decides the best way that he can keep from sacrificing this crew and to save those guys from going back out on a suicide mission if he, is if he deserts. U-boat officers are in short supply. They can't patrol without an executive officer. Uh, so he hopes that if he just walks away from his base, uh, his crewmates will not have to go out on this suicide mission. Meanwhile, here comes Carl's squadron with a bombing raid, and Wilhelm decides to use the chaos of the bombing raid to slip away from his base. These two characters meet up, and after they manage to get through the first five minutes of their meeting without shooting each other, they decide they can uh, probably help each other and work together to uh, survive uh, what's ahead of them. And that, and that is how Silver Wings Iron Cross opens. Uh, this, this book was a labor of love. Years of research and writing went into it. Uh, a lot of different influences went into it. And probably the most important influence was my grandfather. Uh, my maternal grandfather, uh, Morgan Daniel, was a World War II veteran. He was a B-17 mechanic in the legendary 8th Air Force. And I grew up hearing his stories. Those stories inspired me to fly in the military and, and later to write. And uh, I am told that he never talked about the war until I came along as a kid in the 70s. I don't know if it took him that long to, uh, to feel ready to talk about it or if now with, after I came along, there's a boy in the house who's interested in hearing the stories. Maybe that's why he began to talk about it, but I was certainly ready to hear those stories. And uh, even though he was a ground crewman and not a flyer, his stories really illustrated the intensity of the air combat over occupied Europe at that time. Uh, one of his stories in particular really stays with me. He says uh, one day he was marshalling a B-17 back into its hard stand, its parking place at the end of the mission. And uh, as the aircraft had flown the landing pattern to come back in to, uh, to land at base, it had fired flares. And that was a signal that meant wounded aboard roll the ambulances. Well, the airplane lands safely and it's taxiing into its hard stand and my grandfather is marshalling it in and he notices fluid leaking from the aircraft. Well, he's a mechanic, so he's thinking, is, is that oil? Is that hydraulic fluid? What have I got to fix? And as the aircraft uh, moves into position and shuts down the engine, as my grandfather uh, moves toward the aircraft to open the waste doors to help the crew get out, he sees the airplane is not leaking oil or hydraulic fluid. The aircraft itself is dripping blood as so many of the crew members had been hit. And here again, that just illustrates the, uh, the intensity of the combat that the 8th Air Force faced over uh, occupied Europe during that time. The 8th Air Force took uh, a worse casualty rate than Marines in the Pacific. Another mentor who helped uh, influence this novel was a gentleman named Ed Hodges. Ed was a newspaper, newspaper columnist and a political reporter at a newspaper in North Carolina, the Durham Morning Herald. And uh, when I was beginning my civilian career as a reporter, I worked as a, an anchor and uh, journalist at WDNC Radio in Durham. And at the time, WDNC was owned by the Herald Sun Corporation. So I worked in the newsroom that was just down the hall from Ed's office. And he and I became friends and we would go to lunch and so forth. And it, eventually he mentioned he had been a pilot in World War II, and I was very interested in that. And then as, as we got to know each other better, he mentioned that he had flown C-47 cargo aircraft in the China-Burma-India theater, flying over the hump, over the Himalayas, 
uh, taking supplies to uh, forces fighting the Japanese in China. Now, if you know anything about World War II aircraft, the C-47 is, uh, of course, an unpressurized, piston-driven aircraft. It has no business flying over the Himalayas, very dangerous flying. Uh, but those guys made it happen because they had to do it. And uh, uh, I was certainly fascinated by Ed's stories, but Ed was a modest guy. He, he didn't tell me the whole story, only after he passed away and I read with great sadness his obituary that, that I learned that he didn't just fly a few missions over the hump, he completed 50 missions. And in the process, he earned the Bronze Star and the Distinguished Flying Cross. Uh, so again, that was another mentor whose stories helped, helped lead to this novel. Another experience that uh, helped inspire this novel happened to me when I was a student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I was in the scuba club and we dived on shipwrecks off the outer banks of North Carolina. And as it happens, a lot of the wrecks that are within a diveable depth for sport divers are uh, wrecks that went down in World War II, uh, freighters and tankers that were the victims of German U-boats. A lot of people don't realize naval combat came that close to mainland American shores back then, but uh, it certainly did. And, and that fired my interest in the Battle of the Atlantic, and perhaps we can get into that a little bit later in the Q&A session if it comes up, but that was something else that, uh, that helped inspire this novel. Uh, this book came out as we marked the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, and that's a time to reflect on the sacrifices and the accomplishments of the greatest generation. I mean, just imagine what a dark world this would have been if all this time Nazi Germany had ruled half the earth and if Imperial Japan had ruled the other half. But we're starting to forget that history. Uh, in fact, just a couple of years ago, a survey by the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation found that six in 10 Americans didn't know which countries the U.S. fought in World War II. And get this, it wasn't an essay question, it was a multiple choice question, and people still got it wrong. Um, and also on a national and international level, I think uh, we need to do what my characters in this novel did on a personal level, and that is to focus on what uh, unites us instead of what divides us. Now, of course, my little novel won't fix any of that, but I do hope it will become part of the larger conversation about remembering the lessons of World War II. Uh, to shift gears just a little bit, I'll tell you something about this novel's path to publication. Before my wonderful editor at Kensington acquired the novel, uh, there was another publisher that passed on it, and the editor there uh, said the book was old-fashioned. Uh, to that, I plead Guilty as charged. Uh, it's an old fashioned war novel, long enough to tell a good war story with a beginning, a middle and an end in that order. In fact, it has a part one, part two and part three. Um, I don't dare compare myself to the great authors of the mid 20th century who were World War II veterans, but I will say that this novel was inspired by those authors. Uh, I read writers like Norman Mailer uh, James Jones, Herman Wook, and James Mishner, and, and those guys wrote good old-fashioned war stories, and some of them ran fairly long, and, and again, they were uh, great influences that, uh, that gave me some guideposts uh, as, uh, as I wrote this novel. I, um, I certainly enjoyed researching it, and I could go on all day about visiting museums and that kind of thing, and I I won't take up your time with that, but I will say that oddly enough, one of the best research tools that I found was YouTube. And yes, we all know there's a lot of garbage on YouTube, but there's a lot of useful stuff too. And I found that someone or probably several someones has done us authors and historians a great favor by uploading to YouTube uh, lots of training films from World War II. And I was astounded at the quality of those films, but on reflection, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised because back then the War Department brought to bear a lot of high level Hollywood talent. And it's just terrific how, how well these films were written, produced, uh, and acted. Uh, one in particular that was useful to me was How to Fly the B-17. Uh, and the actor Arthur Kennedy, who had quite a career in Hollywood, uh, played the instructor pilot. And he really makes you believe him as, as an experienced B-17 pilot. And those 
those training films, you know, looking at it from the, from the point of view of an author, it give you really granular level of detail about how crews operated those aircraft and how they did things, but it's not just limited to aviation either. You can find training films on uh, stuff like how to load and fire the M1 Garand, uh, how they packed parachutes back then. I uh, found one that was useful on how air crews could avoid flat batteries. Uh, just all kinds of uh, uh, wonderful stuff that people have uploaded to YouTube. Uh, happily, I can say I'm still uh, researching World War II. Right now I'm working on a novel titled The Magnificent Rescue, and it's based on a real world uh, event, something called Operation Halyard, and that was the rescue of more than 500 downed Allied airmen in German-occupied Yugoslavia in 1944. So I'm still having fun with this stuff. So Eric, I'll turn it back over to you for uh, mm. questions. Thanks, Tom. That, that, that was great. And Tom, let me compliment you on your shirt. You're, you're dressed very handsomely today. Um, <laughs> so are you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have a question for both of you that I wanted to ask since this got organized. And David, you, you touched on it, but I want to drill deeper. To what extent are you tormented by the voice of the eventual reader who is going to go, oh, Wilson would not have done that. Oh, oh Tom, you know, Tom, World War II, they never would have done this or that. At what point do you go, it's a novel? And how, how do you balance that out? David, I'll go to you first. Well, there are a lot of, uh, and I want to agree with strongly with Tom, YouTube is an amazing uh, resource. Uh, for me, it was a chance to, to watch how Woodrow Wilson moved, how Clemenceau moved, how, how they spoke, what their voices sounded like. Um, it's, 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 it's fabulous. And you, you want to know those things as a novelist. Um, I did not find, uh, I, I tend not to get hung up on that sort of thing. Um, frankly, because I have confidence in my research and I do include a note at the end about my research and what's true and what isn't. Um, but, you know, for example, you know, Woodrow Wilson is a guy, he's a central figure in the novel. Um, you know, a lot of America has decided to hate him um, in the last few years. Um, he was a Southern guy who was pretty much a racist um, and he did some bad things that way, but, you know, he did some good things too. And, you know, there are some qualities he had, which I thought were important to get across. He, he really liked to tell darky jokes. Um, so I have him tell a darky joke. I, I, God bless the internet. I was able to find a few. Um, hadn't all been taken down yet. And, uh, you know, I kind of have Lloyd George and Clemenceau not quite understanding what the hell this guy's after. Um, but he also loved limericks. Um, he loved to sing hymns. Uh, he was, like all of us, a complicated guy. So, you know, I was able to portray those qualities. And, and you know, I write a lot of nonfiction. So, you know, you could say, well, he liked to s sing hymns, but, you know, have him sing one. And, you know, and with his uh, uh, African American valet joining in or he goads the fellow into singing his favorite hymn, hymn and then Wilson joins in. You know, if the reader wants to say that didn't happen, mazel tov, I'm okay with that um, because I know it did. And uh, that's the confidence, you know, that doing the right research I think gives you. Uh, and I think readers of historical fiction uh, do want to see that note at the end about what was true and what wasn't. Um, so I do feel an obligation to do that. Thanks, David. Tom, <clears throat> how, how do you deal with that conundrum? Uh, well, the short answer is I deal with it exactly uh, as David does. I also include historical notes at the end of the novels to say what's true and what I made up. And um, there, there's a line that exists somewhere about what, what, you can make up and what you have to stay true to. And it's, uh, you know, it's like the old, uh, the old saying about what defines pornography. Well, I know it when I see it, mm -hmm. you know, what, what can I take a historical liberty with? Uh, I, I know it when I see it, you know, uh, for example, uh, 
technical stuff you have to get right. Uh, you can't have the 8th Air Force over Europe bombing Germany in a B-29 because it didn't happen. They used B-17s and B-24s and, um, you know, the B-29 dropped the atomic bomb on Japan. Uh, you can't have an atomic bomb dropped on Europe. I mean, the, the big stuff you have to get right. And generally speaking, the technical stuff you have to get right. Uh, because there's always uh, somebody out there who knows more about the B-17 yes. or the oh, yeah. than you do. And you do hear from those people. Yes, you <laughs> do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you do. But some things you can take liberties with. For example, you know, I talked about the suicide order that uh, Wilhelm's crew received. Uh, according to the uh, memoir that I read uh, by that uh, surviving U-boat captain, that order went out in June of 1944. I took the liberty of having it come out in November of 1944. Right. And uh, it helps when you do that, it helps if you fess up in the historical notes. Right. right. And I try to do that. Th thanks a lot, Tom. <clears throat> Question from the audience to, to David. Did many of the black soldiers end up emigrating to France after the war? Uh, not a giant number, but some, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't mean to be crude, but the French women were not racist, and they found that pleasant, um, mm -hmm. and they felt welcome. Uh, you know, certainly that that doesn't mean all French people are welcoming and uh, uh, all the rest, but it 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 was a very different culture. They had some African influences in France, but not the same history that we did. Um, so it, it was not a, an influx. Um, the real issue after World War I with the black veterans was they came back proud of themselves, proud of their service, proud of how good they were, because um, they were good. And it was the same old country and they were treated the same way and that created a, a real amount of stress in 1919, 1920. We've all been ODing on the, the Tulsa massacre. Uh, I forget the name of the series, but it, uh, there is one on uh, Netflix or something like that about that sequence. It's, it's alternative history. Um, but it was a terrible time of, of race riots and they were, I think, more violent because you had, and I mean this in a, uh, you know, in a complimentary way, you had a lot of uppity blacks who had come back from uh, war, very proud of themselves and what they had done and not willing to take second place. And that created great fiction, uh, friction. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that, it, it, when, for, for me, having the black-white trade-off in my stories um, was something I did impulsively. It was my thought that, well, you need two protagonists, you know, Holmes and Watson and all that sort of thing. And you can have different talents from different people, but it has given for me a lot of satisfaction in trying to explore these attitudes. Um, I have all the uh, complicated experiences that any white American has about race, and it was a chance to, to work on them. Thanks, David. Tom, what is, what is with our obsession with World War II? <laughs> what, what is it about that war that keeps drawing us back? I mean, we have entire channels devoted to it. it it's an endlessly fascinating time period for a lot of reasons. To begin with, so much happened in such a short amount of time. And it set the stage for the world we still live in. I think that's part of the reason uh, it's, uh, it's, it's such fertile ground for continued storytelling. Also, it was, uh, at least from the American point of view, it was uh, a good old fashioned black and white fight, good against evil. Yeah. That's part of it. Uh, another part of it is that 
uh, not only is it great real estate for storytelling, but that real estate is ever expanding. And what I mean by that is we're still learning new things about World War II. Uh, historians are still uncovering things that uh, either have never been known well to the general public or maybe were known at the time and have been, have been lost in the midst of time. And now it's coming back just to give you a, uh, one example, not long ago, I saw a wonderful documentary on television about a guy uh, who was an avid spelunker. He enjoyed exploring caves. And uh, one of the things on his bucket list was go to Ukraine and explore the gypsum caves in Ukraine because they were some of the largest in the world. And while he was exploring these caves, he found 20th century artifacts in the caves, shoes and cookware and so forth. And he started uh, asking around, how did this stuff come to be in this cave? You know, I might've expected to find prehistoric artifacts, but what's up with this stuff? And it turns out that a group of Jews had hidden out in these caves uh, in Ukraine in World War II, and that's how they had survived. And somehow this, is a, this had escaped the notice of historians. And this guy continued doing research. He found some of the survivors, and it was just a fascinating story. And again, that's just an example of how even at this late date, we're still learning new things about what happened during World War II. Thanks, Tom. A question from the audience for, uh, for both of you. What are schools doing wrong about teaching history? David? Oh, I wish I was smarter about this, so I'm gonna, I, I can be short. Um, I, I'm not engaged with the schools enough. I, I know from my own experience, which was in, you know, several thousand years ago, um, we had to memorize too damn much. You know, there were five causes for the Civil War. There were, th you know, three things to know about Woodrow Wilson. There were dates, there were uh, names. And what works, I think, is stories. Um, either, and they'd be good if they're nonfiction stories in a history class. But that's how people learn. That's how you draw them in. Um, one of my children, uh, had a, I think a fifth or sixth grade class, but they spent an entire semester on the Alamo and they read uh, Mexican versions of what happened. They read uh, American versions. They read all different experiences of that conflict in that moment. And he got a great perspective out of it. So, uh, you know, I think that's far more valuable. It teaches critical skills, teaches you how to understand what happened and what, how to interpret things much more than you can from the kind of road memorization I went through. Thanks, David. Tom? Well, I think uh, David hit the nail on the head. The, in, from grades one through 12, you can't possibly teach all the history people need to know. So what you need to do is give students a curiosity about history so that they will continue to self-educate about history. And for whatever reason, I'm not an educator, so it's not my place to second guess educators, but for whatever reason, that doesn't seem to be happening. And I find that there is a tremendous lack of knowledge out there among, uh, among people about World War II and many other aspects of history. Uh, again, just to cite one example, when the movie Saving Private Ryan came out, I was still in the military and the week it came out, I was with a C-130 crew on one of those wonderful peacetime pre-9-11 missions we used to get. We had carried an army guard, a load of army guard troops out to the Midwest for an exercise or something. And we had the evening off and we decided as a crew, we were gonna uh, go to a movie theater off base and see Saving Private Ryan. So we all pile into the blue Air Force van and go out to this movie theater. And we had with us a young co-pilot who was about 25. And to be fair to this guy, uh, he was not stupid. He was a very good pilot. He had done well in training, very conscientious. Everybody liked him. But uh, he was a product of the schools of his day. And he had just not been taught much history and he'd not been fired with an interest in history. And as we're coming out of the movie, uh, we're all talking about how much we like the movie. And he turns to me and he says, wow, yeah, that was a great movie. But that scene at the beginning where they're storming this beach in, in France, is that when World War II started? 
And I said, uh, no, that was closer to the end than the beginning. Um, and this, this poor guy just had no clue because he'd not been taught this stuff and he'd not been uh, inspired to read about this stuff. And as, as, I, as I've often said to people, uh, you don't expect stupid people to know their history because that's par for the course, but it's a little more concerning when the smart people don't know it either. Well, well, Tom, as, as John Belushi said in Animal House, was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? <laughs> there you go. Roger. Yes. Um, thank you. I, I'm going to step in here a little bit. This is a question that's near and dear to my heart. I'm, uh, I'm in the business of publishing, and I actually publish some historical fiction, particularly for children. But uh, given this question, we're actually lucky to have, as a member of our audience, uh, somebody who I'm going to embarrass a little bit here, one of my authors who I am going to be publishing uh, next year. And I, I know this is going to sound like a commercial, but it's apropos to the question that has been asked. I, I want to share with you, and then I'm going to ask her to make a comment about... Um, a, a part of her website that um, that she has um, um, provided um, or that she has done for her book. The, the title of the book is The Remarkable Cause, a novel of James Lovell and the Crucible of, of the Revolution. Now, the author, Jean O'Connor, um, is a teacher of the year, she can give me the actual t uh, title that she won, but she, she was teacher of the year in, in Montana, I believe. And I want you to, I want to draw your attention to what she's created on her website here, this tab called study. And here she talks about the research for her book, the study guide, writing ideas. Uh, she also has, um, uh, satire of the period in which she writes and news of the day. I mean, she's put all of this together on her website. And I, and with that, I, I just wanted to, Jean, if, if you're, um, I'm, I hope you're willing uh, to just give us an idea of what, what teachers can do, um, both public school and private school, to, to, to teach history. Oh, you're, you're on mute, Jean. You're on mute. It's unmute here. Self, I'm sorry. There Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate your asking me that question. Um, I think that teachers need to, as, as both David and Tom said, in integrate story. Story is huge. History can be taught so well and so effectively by drawing the students into what happened and, and how, you know, how was that real in those days? Um, and, and there's also other ways to draw that in. You can have literature combined with the study of history, which is something I did a lot of when I was teaching. Um, as an English teacher and a history teacher, I, I knew how to pull that together and I would have students know what was happening in the history of the novel. I mean, the grapes of wrath, you know, to kill a mockingbird, you can't, there's so many examples. Um, Hemingway. So what was going on and how did that affect the authors and how did that affect the story? And again, you, you can't expect in a history class for a student to understand every little thing. It just doesn't make sense. But there's a great deal of wonderful things being done now with the students sometimes in upper level classes like AP, um, other kinds of accelerated learning, and, and even in regular classes as well, where students can, can read good literature and get to know that history, and it makes it all so much real for them. And they carry that experience. As, as you pointed out, um, I think that was David who said that his nephew or somebody had studied the Alamo. Well, yeah, you study one thing in depth, then you know something else. It, it starts to make sense. Those connections come alive. Well, thank you so much, Jean. I, yeah, I you're welcome. Your, thank you. Uh -huh. You're stepping in. I'm going to turn it back to Eric here so we can get back to more audience questions. But it's, I think it's, it's so important for, for all of us 
to be cognizant of, of how we have these wonderful stories that people like uh, Eric and David and Tom and, and Jean create and um, how rich uh, they are and as, as teaching tools and, and recommending to our, the teachers that we know uh, to, to use this, um, uh, use these resources. So Eric, back, back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. A uh, question for both of you. One of the things that I find myself talking with other authors about, and David, I think we've had this discussion, is what is happening with political correctness in the publishing world? Um, you're not allowed to say certain things. I mean, you, you wrote a book about where Will, Woodrow Wilson is a character. He's been canceled. Um, and I think that there's a lot of fear in the author community. I, I know there are people out there who think that, uh, well, it's about time political correctness dominated. It's really harmless. But I, what I had, what has amazed me in discussions with author friends who are on the left and the right is there's very similar fears about what's happening there. Have you found this, are you concerned about this or is this just fashion? David? Uh, you know, I have to be a little concerned about it because I would like people to read my books. Um, and so you can't afford to be totally out of step. Um, with my forthcoming book on George Washington, the editor said, you know, we're gonna capitalize black everywhere where you use it. You know, Washington was a slave owner. We, I had to deal with that issue. Um, and I said, fine, you know, okay. I, I don't have a doctrinal position on that. Um, and, and I knew I had to talk about slavery because you just can't not. And frankly, you shouldn't be able to talk about George Washington without talking about it. Um, there are, you know, moments where that are puzzling. Uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson becoming a, a monster is a surprise uh, to me. I mean, I went to a school where they've taken his name off the, the wall. It used to be named for him at Princeton. Um, and, you know, I don't think he's like the guys who took up arms against the country and, and you know, were essentially committing treason. He just you know, had a really bad attitude about a, an important issue. So I find uh, it, it is something we have to navigate around. Um, and I try to do it in a way that makes me feel comfortable. I, you know, I, I had a, a mixed race partnership because I wanted to deal with it. Uh, and I had a African-American friend read the first one just to be sure I got, I wasn't getting it all wrong. And she actually pointed out something I did get all wrong. Um, and that's, that was important. Um, but, you know, we've got to, you know, there's words you can't use. I mean, <laughs> it, it's a tricky time right now. Uh, and I want to tell the stories. Uh, and I, you know, I, I love Tom's reference to be writing an old fashioned book. I mean, I believe in old fashioned books. I think we like stories. Uh, Gone with the Wind uh, is a great story. Um, you know, not particularly PC. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've still got to make room for that. Uh, and that doesn't mean we don't have to change the culture, but, you know, literature explores every part of human experience. So. Hey, thanks, David. Tom, and six, you have 60 seconds to tell us how you feel about this issue. <laughs> Sorry. I've really not okay. found political correctness a limiting factor in my own writing. I would just add in this brief time that it's probably important to remember that historical figures are probably more nuanced and complex than we realize. And I go back to my grandfather, who I mentioned earlier. Um, I've I've heard him use language I wouldn't use in a public forum. However, later in his life, in his uh, career in local politics, he helped lead desegregation of the local county schools. Now, who among us can say they did anything that important, but yet 
uh, some of the things he said would have been called uh, politically incorrect, Let, yet he led desegregation efforts. So again, the, the people who came before us were often more nuanced uh, than we realize now. Thanks, Tom. Roger? Well, this is where I get to step in and thank everybody. Um, I would love to, uh, I really appreciate the time uh, that David Stewart and Tom Young and Eric Denzenhall and our, our pop-in guest, Gene O'Connor, have spent doing all this research and their talent for providing uh, wonderful stories which come from reality um, that teach us something. So I thank our authors. Um, I thank you, our audience. You guys were given a real treat here tonight. Um, I thought this was a little different than what I've done in the past, but really quite special. And I thank you authors for sharing your thoughts. And I thank everyone for joining us tonight um, to hear uh, what our authors had to say. I, I have been recording this. This will be on the past shows tab um, as a recording uh, at historyauthortalks.com. Uh, next week on October 27th at 7 p.m., we sort of go back to our regularly scheduled programming where I have um, Mark uh, Lender who and Christian McBurney who have written um, books on a number of topics, but next week is really about the Monmouth campaign during the American Revolution in 1778. Um, one of the largest battles in the American Revolution on a very hot day um, with uh, some am amazing occurrences. So I invite you all to join us uh, next Tuesday at seven o'clock um, at History Author Talks. And uh, again, I thank you all, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Good night. Thanks very much. Good night.